It's a real joy to see everybody here today. I'm Deepak Bhargava, Executive Director of the Center for Community Change. Today, thank you. Today, CCC, the Center for Popular Democracy, Jobs with Justice, the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights, and the Working Families Organization are launching a major new national campaign called Putting Families First, Good Jobs for All. The goal of this campaign is to put big ideas and big solutions to the crises of inequality and poverty that our families face on the top of the nation's political agenda. We're joined by grassroots organizations in 41 states who are pioneering the cutting edge solutions to good jobs throughout the country. I'd like to ask those leaders and organizers from communities around the country to please stand so we can give them a round of applause. We're joined today by some really important allies. Mary Kay Henry of the Service Employees International Union, which has played a pivotal and inspiring role in launching the Fight for 15 that has captured the moral imagination of all of us and the country, by elected champions like Senator Sherrod Brown, Senator Elizabeth Warren, former Governor Ted Strickland, Congressman Keith Ellison, Congresswoman Karen Bass, and leaders and thinkers from key sectors and organizations throughout the nation. Thank you for your presence and your leadership. We've had a slight um, shift in the program because of the unpredictable schedule on the Hill. So I'd like to take the uh, pleasure and honor of introducing to you Senator Sherrod Brown. He is a champion of working people in Ohio and all across this country, whether it's worker rights, fighting bad trade deals, championing health care for all, demanding retirement security, or standing up for social security, he has been one of the most passionate and committed leaders to the cause of economic justice in this country. The idea of good jobs for all has been his life's work. Pastor Harrison from the Ohio Organizing Collaborative couldn't be here today, but he wanted me to say about the senator that he has not only been there on the issues that this campaign is about, he's been there with working families on picket lines, in church basements, in the neighborhoods, standing with families living on the brink every single day. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Senator Sherrod Brown. Thank you, Deepak. It's a little weird to have this big screen this close to me in a room this size, but whatever you guys work out is all right with me. So, um, I knew I was in the right. Governor Strickland, nice to see you. How are you? Don't look at that. No. Uh, I, 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 Mary Kate, so glad you're here. And my longtime friend, Heather and Paul Booth, in the back, and so many of you. And Deepak, thank you for your work. And um, thanks, especially the Ohio Organizing Collaborative. Uh, for all the support. So. Um, I knew I was in the right place. I got out of the car, and all of a sudden, I see five or six people in T-shirts uh, that say community organizer. So this is the right place. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I want to start off by telling, well, I want to start off by telling you a little story about um, back in 1970, there was, a, um, there was a political scientist named Ben Wattenberg, and he has been mostly forgotten, if he was even well known then, but he decided to find um, who was kind of in the middle, what single person represented what America was in economic terms, and he settled on a woman, the wife of a machinist in a suburb of Dayton, Ohio, uh, who had, in those days, had a solid middle-class lifestyle. Um, her family had a decent wage because he carried a union card. Uh, he had a defined pension benefit. She was a mostly stay-at-home mother. This was 1970, but she worked part-time doing some other things. Uh, and they knew that they would have a decent pension. They knew that they would have decent wages. They could send their child to Ohio State or to the University of Cincinnati to a state school um, and not burden that child with debt. My, my wife, for instance, a working class kid, her parents were maintenance, her dad 
My mom was a home care worker. Her dad worked as a utility company as a maintenance worker. She graduated from Kent State in the 1970s with $1,200 in debt. That was the 1970s. So let's call this woman Joan from Dayton, Ohio, who, um, who was really right in the middle. Again, a, a decent, she, could re, she and her husband would be able to retire with a decent, decent pension. They had a decent standard of living. Their children could go to college. They didn't graduate with huge debt. They owned, they owned one car. Uh, today, uh, let's talk about Sheila from Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, Sheila, as opposed to Joan, um, is in a situation where she's 55 years old. She has almost no savings. She doesn't have a defined pension benefit. Uh, as a 55-year-old, she has about $20,000 in savings. It might be a 401k. It might be something else. Uh, she cobbles together whatever she can do to kind of keep going. Understand, half, of, half the people in this country are worse off than Sheila. Half are better off, half are worse, worse off. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what the economy is all about today. It's, it's because of trade agreements. It's because of globalization. It's because corporate profits are, are up and productivity is up and workers aren't sharing in the wealth they create. It's all of those issues swirling around what Joan benefited from in 1970 and what Sheila uh, is not doing so well in, 2000, uh, in 2015. Uh, Sheila's also, Sheila's kids will go to Youngstown State University or go to Eastern Gateway Community College, which governors have been involved with over the years. Uh, and, she, and Sheila's kids will be, on the average, face about $30,000 in debt when they graduate. Uh, many of you in this room obviously aren't making a lot of money. You're faced with a lot of student debt. Makes it harder to get married, makes it harder to start a, start a business, makes it harder to buy a house, makes it harder to do all the things that 40 years ago, Joan's kids could do, Sheila's kids too often can't. At the same time, uh, we see the right-wing attacks on the labor movement. Um, we've seen my state, my region of the country, Ohio, um, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, have borne the brunt of them, but they're everywhere. They've borne the brunt of them partly because we had a progressive, we had generally progressive government in terms of organized labor. Today, we're playing defense time and time and time again. Um, I have worn on my lapel a pen depicting a canary in a birdcage. It was given to me um, at a Workers' Memorial Day rally about 15 years ago. And it signifies to, to me what this fight's all about. It's a depiction of a canary in a birdcage. You know the story of the mine worker taking the canary down in the mines. Uh, the, if the canary died from lack of oxygen or died from toxic gas, the mine worker had to get out of the mines. He had no union in the 1900 to protect him, and he had no government, no union strong enough, nor no government that cared enough to protect him in those days. Uh, a child born in the United States of America in 1900 had a life expectancy of about 45 years. Now, we live, we live 30 years longer today, a child born today, uh, depending on where, and I heard a minister in Martin Luther King Day in Cleveland said your life expectancy is connected to your zip code. We know what that's all about. Um, if you grew up in Appalachia, you grew up in the inner city, you grow up versus growing up in a place like Shaker Heights or Bethesda, you, you know the difference, what you have with educational opportunities, what you have with a social safety net, what you have with income and, and privilege and all that comes with that. But this canary, this, so in 1900, since, since 1900, we live 30 years longer on the average, and we do because of people like you and people like your parents and your grandparents that were part of the labor movement. Uh, people we, we um, just in, in these hundred years, the 30 years, additional years life, life expectancy is all about Medicare, it's about Social Security, it's about women's rights, it's about civil rights, it's about ban on child labor, it's about Medicaid, it's about safe drinking water, it's about clean air, it's about pure food laws, it's about all the things that people struggled for. And none of these things came easy. Politicians rarely do things like start Medicare or um, pass a higher minimum wage without agitation, without people um, with shirts that say community organizers, or at least acting that way, whether they have the shirts on or not, and making sure that, that, we, you know, that, that we push our government to do that. The safe drinking water laws, the clean air laws happened even though the most powerful people in the society opposed them. Social Security happened even though the most powerful people in society opposed them. Medicare 1965 happened um, even though the insurance companies and the, you know, the, the, the Tea Party of then, the John Birch Society, opposed it. We, um, we, we, we knew that it was because of, of 
people like you, people in their union halls, in their church basements, in their community organizations, fighting for these issues and, and moving this country forward. Um, I want to go back to um, in, in the, la the last time the, 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 um, the Republican Party is coming to Cleveland for their uh, Republican convention. I'm actually, I live in Cleveland, my wife and I do. I'm glad they're coming to Cleveland, but it might be kind of fun too. But the last time, the last time there was a Republican convention in Cleveland was 1936 when a uh, Republican candidate for president against FDR got, I think, nine electoral votes. So we'll see how that plays out. But, but at the end of, at the end of 1936, FDR, I want to quote from FDR. He visited Cleveland. Uh, this was weeks after the Republican convention. He, he, he spoke about why trickle-down theory doesn't work. I want to share some of his words. He said, it's to the real advantage of every producer, every manufacturer, every merchant to cooperate in the improvement of working conditions because the best customer of American industry is the well-paid worker. Um, that speech could have been given today. Uh, it's unfortunately not given by enough politicians, but it could have been given today. Um, that's, that's why we need to change this debate. We need the Social Security debate not to be about balancing the budget. We need the Social Security debate to be about uh, pension, about, about retirement security. Uh, Sheila, I was talking about from Youngstown, she has no defined pension benefit. She, has, she will get about $1,100 a month of Social Security if she's, and she's right in the middle. Uh, two-thirds to three-fourths of her income as a senior citizen will be that $1,100 or $1,200 a month she gets in Social Security. Uh, so that, that's, I mean, understand what that's all about. We know that, I mean, we, we need to change the debate in terms of wages in this country. You know from 1946 to 1973, productivity in this country went up, wages went up. Since 1973, especially since 2000, as the union movement has declined, as the fewer and fewer people in the labor movement, productivity still goes up, uh, executive compensation goes up, profits go up, wages have been stagnant. We, we, need to, we need to join that debate. That means, obviously it means raising the minimum wage significantly. It means community organizing around the $15 that, C that started in SeaTac in Seattle and San Francisco and needs to make its way across the country. And nobody's working on that better than Mary, Mary Kay Henry. I thank her for that. It, it means we need to expand the, expand the earned income tax credit, rewarding people that are making twenty and thirty and forty thousand dollars a year. It means we need to push hard the Department of Labor on its rules to make sure that the McDonald the, the worker at McDonald's who happens to be the night manager that gets paid twenty five or thirty thousand dollars a year, but is considered management and he works sixty hours a week and he, she works sixty hours a week and she doesn't get overtime. We need to change those rules. The Department of Labor is on the cusp of doing it. You need to weigh in and make sure that DOL passes. The DOL hands down a rule, not, not lobbied by the fast food industry, not lobbied by Walmart, not lobbied by uh, those that, that want to put those people in a category where they're not getting minimum wage. You can make such a difference weighing in with DOL and weighing in the White House and that. We, and I will, um, and I, I I, I want to, you know, I want to talk for a moment about what what we have seen uh, on the state and local level in organizing. I, I, I the, the fifteen dollar for the fight for fifteen campaign is so important. Uh, what what we did in Ohio, fighting back on collective bargaining, we had on our ballot in two thousand eleven in Ohio. The, we had the um, the first time ever in the history of the when when the Republican legislature tried to take collective bargaining rights away from public employees in 2011. Uh, we petitioned, we meaning the, the labor movement, but way more than the labor movement was part of, were, were, were key to that. Um, it was the first time in American history where the actual right to collective bargaining was on a statewide ballot. A big state, a swing state, we won that with 61, 61 point something percent of the vote. <laughs> And you, and, and you know the success, uh, you know the success of minimum wage fights around the country, even in states where uh, Democrats lost in 2014, minimum wage campaigns were successful. They were successful because people organizing and fighting for minimum wage know how to talk to people. Um, they, and I, I think that people in my party need to know how to talk to people in the same way that to embrace the minimum wage, to embrace, to embrace a significantly higher minimum wage, and to embrace all those issues. Let, let, me, let me conclude with this. I, I, um, I, I, was, uh, I was the co-leader, uh, the co-chair of the, 
of the return uh, to Mark, to, re to do the um, trip to Selma, Montgomery, and Birmingham. Uh, there were 90 some members of Congress. I was the co chair of that delegation with a Republican from South Carolina. And I want to tell you two stories about, about John Lewis and uh, Selma, Montgomery, and Birmingham. The first one is I, I think you all know John Lewis is congressman from Atlanta, uh, been in Congress almost 30 years. Uh, the most honorable, decent person I've ever met. If you want to read, he, he, he wrote a book a couple of years ago. He has a chapter on faith. And I know much of the organizing collaborative in Ohio is faith-based, coming out of our churches uh, in the cities and rural areas, all that. And John, John's faith was all about knowing that, that we, we, in civil rights and as economic progressives, that we will win these battles. The, the arc of history, the moral arc of history bends towards justice sort of came out of John Lewis's, I mean, that, that the, the use of that out of his belief that, that he, could, he, he was able to endure the pain, and he was beaten up literally more than anybody in the Civil Rights Movement. He was able to endure that pain because he knew in the end um, that justice would prevail. It might not even be during his lifetime, but he knew in the end justice would prevail. And the, the chapter he writes in his book about faith, you know, whether you consider yourself very religious or not, is, is really important in understanding how your work matters so much. You don't get paid a lot, you don't get rewards often enough, but when you do, when you're victorious, the, the difference you make. But a couple of stories about John. The first one, he, um, 1961, John Lewis, 21 years old, um, was, um, was one of the original Freedom Riders. And if you know this history, this will, this will resonate. If you don't, it still will. John, John got on a bus. In those days, when a bus crossed the Mason-Dixon line, going south, uh, the, everybody got out. If it was a commercial bus, Greyhound or, or, or Trailways, everybody got out of the bus. White people went, got back in in the front. African Americans got, sat in the back. Um, that was the law in some states, the custom when the bus lines crossed the Mason-Dixon line. So John and uh, about a dozen young men and women, half white, half black, were challenging that because they knew that, that the country didn't believe, didn't agree with it and that the, the, the things needed to change and ultimately Congress needed to buy that lobby and the courts needed to move. So John, um, John got on the bus, they bought tickets from Washington, bus ticket from Washington to New Orleans. Uh, John's sitting next to a young white man from Connecticut. They cross, they leave Washington, they cross into Virginia, they go through North Carolina, they stop at a bus stay station in Rock, uh, Rock Hill, South Carolina. Uh, the white man gets out of the bus and he walks towards the colored waiting room colored waiting room. John gets out of the bus, walks towards the whites waiting room. And as John approached the bus, approached, approached the, uh, the, the waiting room, the mob descended on him. Some man hit him with an apple crate and knocked him out. And John, that was one of many, many times John was assaulted and injured pretty badly um, during the civil rights movement. Uh, 2000, that was 1961. 2009, John's in his office in Washington. Uh, an older man comes to see him in his mid-70s, John thought, with his son. And John sits down with him and the man says, um, Congressman, um, I, I used to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I'm the man that hit you with the apple crate. And he said, I'm here to ask your forgiveness. And John, being John, forgave him and they have stayed in touch ever since. Uh, now John, John tells the story and to sort of complete this circle, John spoke at Ole Miss, was the graduation speaker of all places in Oxford, Mississippi in 2014, a place John would, could never have gone to school when he was a young man, um, or any other, any other university, the State University in the South in those days. And he told this story, he said, when I was growing up in Troy, Alabama, I grew up just outside of Troy on a chicken farm. When I was growing up in Troy, Alabama, I, I was 15, I noticed the signs when I went into town in Detroit that said uh, white bathroom, white water fountain, colored water fountain, white bathroom, colored bathroom. And he said, I went to my parents and I said, why is that? What, what, what is that about? And his parents said, um, that's the way it is, John, don't get in the way, uh, don't get in trouble. John then says, when I was 17, I went off to school, I met Rosa Parks. When I was 18, I met Dr. Martin Luther King. These two individuals, I told them my story about my parents and grandparents, and these two individuals said, uh, no, you have to get in the way, you have to get in trouble. 
So John encouraged people in, this, in his speeches. John says it's important that you get in the way, that you get in trouble, that you make trouble, that you make good, necessary trouble. And that's what you're all about. That's, that's what's so important about your work. That's why you matter. That's why as organizers, as people that care about moving this country forward, of giving working class and poor families a real chance at the American dream, get in trouble, get in good, necessary trouble, make trouble, make good, necessary trouble, that will help you change the world. Thank you so much.